Blackout. Posted by Angel Haisho. It was annoying at first. The occasional creaking of the house, power shortages, no heating, things you would expect to find in a small town up in Scotland. Since I had lived here for a good four years, I had gotten used to those events occurring. Gradually, it got worse. The power would stay out for hours, sometimes even days. The cold winds would shake the old house. I stopped bothering to light candles when the lights died. The currents of air would just seep through the cracks around the windows and blow them out, the usual routine. After a few months, the situation became more serious. Don't take it the wrong way. Everyone was trying to help, but our efforts just kept failing. Then it happened. The cars just stopped, completely stopped. We were baffled. One of the locals blamed the magnetic fields or some other scientific explanation. It wasn't the last. Because of the dangers of driving when dusk fell, there was now a curfew. From 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. no cars were allowed on the roads due to risk of it happening again. Now, of course I had broken that rule a few times, but I soon learnt my lesson. It was winter, the worst time of the year. It got darker earlier. A thin layer of snow coated the area, freezing everything in its path. Many of the citizens had moved south, mostly to London due to the increasing risk. More power shortages occurred and the decreasing temperature wasn't helping. The northern part of the town was in a dire condition. And I was left alone. Being stubborn and arrogant, I refused to leave when they issued the amber warning. I had plenty of food to last the winter, many thick coats and jumpers. I'll be just fine, I said. Dear God, I was wrong. It was never the creaking of the house or the banging of the loose shed door which bothered me. It was something else. I couldn't put my finger on it. One minute I would be walking down the hall and then the lights would just, just turn off. You could still hear the hum of the boiler under the staircase. So the electricity was fine, I concluded. Then just like that, the lights would pop back on. The house was colder though, probably due to the lack of light. The windows let less sun in, more frost had grown up along the frame, sealing the cracks. I started to light more candles as the blackouts became more common, but when the lights went out, so did the candles. It was a Sunday evening, the third blackout of the day. So far, it has been three hours long. Every candle I light, every light source I create, darkens until it disappears. The more clothing I put on, the more blankets I wrapped around my frail body, the icier I became. The more food I ate, whether cooked or not, I grew more and more ravenous. The more I spoke or created noise of any sort, the quicker it died down into a deathly silence. I soon found myself glancing at the clock every second. An idea came to mind. I was stupid. I wish I never did it, but being me, I did. Grabbing my car keys, I stepped into the arctic wind. It stung any exposed flesh. Since I hadn't been outside in months, due to the dangerously cold air, I glanced at my home and others around it. Each house had dents from being hit with tree branches or loose debris which the wind had picked up. My house, though, was the only one with claw marks engraved into the wooden paneling, Never once had I heard an animal or the sound of claws being dug into wood and considering I was in complete silence most of the time. Baffled and confused, I had started my car up, thankful it still worked. The snow was thick, but I managed to force my car onto the thinnest patch. More momentum and more power soon had my car driving south. I glanced at the small digital clock within the car's dashboard. 8.33 p.m. Curfew was within 27 minutes, but I didn't give a second thought to the curfew. I was the only one there, so why should I follow the rule? That's the mistake I made. Distracting myself and getting cocky, I soon found a patch of black ice. Skidding after pulling the brakes, the car slowly stopped. Within that breathtaking second, my heart hammering against my ribcage, the car stopped completely. All lights turned off, 
The gentle humming of the engine filled the air. The engine was off though. The sound continued and my breathing became heavier. I didn't know what was happening. Was the oxygen levels decreasing? Was I hyperventilating due to shock? I still don't know, but what I do know is that I made the worst decision of my life. It still invades my dreams, my nightmares. A cold hand brushed my shoulder. I froze, not moving a single muscle. The smell of rotting flesh filled my nose. Eyes wide, I glanced at the rear view mirror, straining my eyes so I could make out what was in the back seat of my car. There was nothing, nothing but a single shadow. Not mine though, it looked like a small ape, hunched over. Long fingers came out of small hands. It moved with caution. The shadow was directly behind me. I had to bite my tongue so that I wouldn't scream in terror. The humming was louder, and the more I listened to it, the fainter I became. I could taste bile in the back of my throat. Black stops danced within my vision. Soon the smell of flesh and the humming overwhelmed my senses completely. Tears threatened to fall as I watched the ape-like shadow slung a bony arm around my neck. It was rough and hairy, a thick sickly aroma as given off. Soon so many black spots filled my vision I could no longer see, no longer hear, smell, touch. I was completely numb. I woke up three days later. Some guy found me stiff as a rock in the same position I was in before. Toes and fingers were black. I had a minor case of frostbite. My vision was still blurry though. When I had reached civilization, I still experienced the blackouts. I would thrash about in my chair or bed when one would occur. The shadow of the ape-like creature lurked in the corner of my vision. I would scream and cry out, but no sound would escape my lips. Years later, the blackouts decreased. I found out that the lights were on. Even when I could only see darkness, no one else saw that creature. I was grateful yet jealous at that fact. Occasionally, I do get glances of it, feel long nails gently graze my skin as I sleep. I moved to Cornwall when I felt as though I could handle life without assistance. Never once had I dared to visit Scotland again, but that doesn't mean I was left alone. Antran Posted by Ehrlich Smash The picture you're staring at was taken sometime in the 70s. It's the only remaining image I have left of my son and the artificial being known as Antran, whom we adopted into our family at the time. It was a warm summer back in the mid-70s. I was driving home from my logging company after a long shift, when I had to make a stop at the local garbage tip to drop off some old desks my mother had given us. Something caught the corner of my eye as I bent down, and, upon closer inspection, was shocked to see what I originally thought was a doll. A plastic outer shell with metal limbs. And more shockingly, a humanoid face with cold, dark eyes. I'll be honest to say I was curious at the time and incredibly impressed with the workmanship, so I didn't think twice before placing it carefully along the back seat of my car and took it home. My son's interest was almost as intense as mine, and we bonded over the course of a few days opening it up, looking at its circuitry and seeing if anything had been misplaced or broken. Eventually, to our surprise, the being, or android, seemed to come to life. Its eyes displayed a somewhat sentient tint to them, its limbs turned, its hands gripped and, after a few moments, it managed to stand on its own accord. Needless to say, we were scared, yet fascinated. Who could have created such a wonderful and remarkable piece of work? I thought to myself. It wasn't until a few weeks later that I realized this wasn't a toy or a doll. It showed incredible signs of intelligence and thinking ability. It learned to do everyday things, such as taking the trash out, playing with my son's toys. He even had a favorite, a small, red car that he'd drive alongside the kitchen counters. It learned to mimic our ways, trying to eat from a fork, despite having no digestive system, 
moving its mouth, despite lacking the ability to speak. I knew this was something else, perhaps a military piece of hardware or a private project. I knew I should have handed him in, but when I watched my boy play with it so happily, his face lit up. I couldn't do it. He's always been so lonely. This was one of his only friends. What kind of father would I be to deny him the right of happiness? It couldn't hurt to allow him to keep it for a while. We named him Antrin, which was the print in capitals written in small font across his back. A few months passed quickly, and family life seemed to be improving. He was one of us. My lad's grades improved, his mood improved, everything was getting better. Until one evening in July, I was sitting in my armchair, with a beer watching television. My boy and Antrin had knelt down on the rug, fighting with one another, as boys do. When suddenly my attention was drawn to a loud gasp, I looked down and saw my child gripping his arm. What's wrong, Adam? I asked. He rolled up his sleeve, and on his arm was a large, red mark covering his forearm. Antrin pinched me, he replied in a shaky voice. The mark was indeed red. It would soon bruise into a swollen, purple lump. My fatherly instincts took over me and, like a parent telling off a naughty child, I shouted at the android. Its cold, metallic face, for a moment, seemed to show genuine sadness and sorrow, as though it didn't know its own strength, as though it was sorry, its lips moved. Whether it was trying to muster up the words to apologize through language or merely copying what I was doing, we will never know. Later on in the evening, I apologized for the shouting, told it everything was okay, and thought nothing of it. A few weeks later, my child came into my room. It must have been early morning. My slumber was interrupted by the gentle creaking of my bedroom door. Dad, he whispered. Yes, son, I replied. It keeps looking at me. What? What does? I asked him, through tired eyes. Antrin, he keeps looking at me, at the end of my bed. His voice trembled, fearful. I could tell something wasn't right. I noticed him rubbing his other arm, and immediately called him over. Pulling up his sleeve, my heart sank. More bruises. Must have been four, five all the way up his small arms. Take off your shirt, Adam, I asked, trying to keep calm. I could feel a cocktail of emotions rising within me. Panic, fear, anger. He took off his shirt. As the waist pulled over his small head, my heart sunk further and my eyes welled up. Before me, my son stood. His small frame is coated in bruises, different sizes, different shades of browns and purples. Immediately I got up and stormed to Adam's room. Nothing. I shouted at the top of my lungs for the being, looking under the bed, out the closed bedroom window. Nothing. Suddenly a loud knock from above us, then hard footsteps. It's in the loft. I whispered, my eyes to the heavens. As I paced down the corridor, I noticed the walls on either side of me were coated in scratches all the way up to the now swinging piece of string that leads to the small loft door. Slowly, I pulled it open, telling my scared son to stay where he was. The ladder fell down and I climbed up. Taking a hold of the torch we left on the side of the opening, I turned it on, only to find the small window we have in there smashed. It had escaped. Immediately I considered calling the emergency services, but who's going to believe me? A sentient metallic being hurting my child? They'll take one look at the bruises and they'd have locked me up for abuse. I had no choice but to keep quiet. Weeks, then months passed. Every time we went outside, we noticed ever increasing signs of Antrin's presence, the familiar scratch marks alongside the pricking of my home. Plants had been disturbed, patches of mud leading up to the windows. I feared for my son, taking him to and from school, never letting him out of my sight. 
What had caused this sudden hostility towards us? Had we done it wrong? Was it my shouting? I found myself speaking out loud in the evenings, apologizing to the walls, to an empty room in the hopes Antron would hear, hoping he would stop the taunting, the endless stalking of my home. But my attempts were in vain. If I had known what would come, I wouldn't have slept that night. My sleep was once again disturbed, though this time by a blood-curdling scream. My eyes darted open and immediately, almost as a natural instinct, I rushed to my son's room. It was too late. The room had been turned upside down. Everything was on the floor. The bed sheets ripped and his window smashed. I burst into tears, screaming at the top of my voice for my son's back. I called the police, telling them my son had been kidnapped. They asked if I had seen the culprit. I lied and said I hadn't, hoping the images of my son would be enough. Like they'd believe that this doll was sentient, harmful. For the next few days, I cried myself to sleep, sobbing like a child. Life wasn't worth living anymore. I wish I had never found that thing. I betrayed my son's trust in me as a father to protect him and now I pay the price. It was a September dawn and I sat in my armchair, drinking, when I heard the pantry door creak open, rushing to the kitchen. Again, nothing. Except, there on the kitchen counter, Antron's favorite, red, toy car. Chained. Hosted by Sludgeball. I awoke to the sound of dripping water. It was coming from somewhere in the kitchen, the open door just a few feet away. The smell hit me, just as pungent as it was when I went to sleep. My eyes started to water at the pure concentration of the odor, and the nausea set in. How long has it been since I arrived here? A week? A month? It sure felt like forever, but time was useless for me, since I knew however long it had been wouldn't affect how long it would be until I could leave. I heard the muffled humming, coming from a distance. It was him. He was on his way back. As he got closer, I heard the scrape of the rifle's rusty old barrel against the dirt. He was humming the song he always did when he caught some fresh game, and I could hear the pleasure in his deep grumble of a hum. His boots were hitting the ground with a satisfying thump, and he sounded in no way of a hurry. The steps got closer, and I heard him walk up the creaky wooden porch towards the old door. The door opened slowly, but with purpose. The man, who was built big and stocky, with large hands and feet and more hair on his chest than a werewolf, walked slowly towards the kitchen, still humming his tune. In his hand, I could see a dead rabbit, its lifeless body dangling like a deflated balloon after a birthday party. He walked through the doorway, and I heard a loud plunk as he set the rabbit down on a wooden board somewhere. I had just started to realize how hungry I was. I couldn't remember the last time I ate. When the man came back out, I let out a faint whisper. Please, please, please give me something to eat. The man looked at me and gave me a creepy smile. A small chuckle came out and then silence. But you haven't even started performing for me today. I knew this meant that I wasn't getting fed for a while. The blisters on my hands and feet were killing me and looked infected. If only the chain wasn't so strong, I could probably break them and make an escape. The man went back into the kitchen, and I heard him open and close the refrigerator. He walked out holding a cold beer and slowly made his way towards the couch in the room across from me. He sat on his couch, let out a great big sigh, and turned on the television. I was sitting there alone in the dark for what seemed like hours, hunger driving me insane. I tried again and again to slip my feet out of the chains, but was to no prevail. They were too tight around my bony ankles. I fell back to sleep, wishing it could all be over. After a few minutes, I hear him stomping up a staircase and possibly dragging something behind him. He shuts a door 
and I hear the familiar sound of something locking. He makes his way over to me with a crazed look on his face. He is covered in blood from head to toe and is holding what seems to be some sort of kitchen knife. He walks back into the kitchen and drops his weapon into the sink. The man comes back out, still blood dripping from his beard, and walks over to me, holding a whip. He leans over, and I can smell the alcohol on his breath. You want to be fed? I give a small nod, and he unravels his whip. Well, you are going to have to work for it. The way he said this deeply unsettled me, and I could tell that whatever was coming, it was not going to be fun. Dance for me, he said, but all I could do was show confusion in my expression, as I had no idea what he meant. Dance for me now. He is at the top of his lungs. I stood up and started moving my body, but I wouldn't call it dancing. The man took the whip in one hand, leaned back, and looked like he was ready to strike. With one quick movement, he took a hard whip at my feet, hitting the top of my right foot. I fell to the ground and started sobbing. He commanded that I get up and continue, and I tried my best to fulfill his orders. He again started whipping my feet until I started dancing as fast as I could. After about five minutes of this, I collapsed from exhaustion. The man gave one final chuckle and walked into the kitchen again, with a wide smile on his face. He grabbed the dead rabbit and brought it back. He put his large hands around the rabbit, one on its head and one right below the neck. He pulled until an awful sound of bones breaking and flesh ripping pierced the air around me. The head of the rabbit, now free from the body, was gripped in the man's right hand like he was palming a basketball. He dropped the rabbit's head on the ground in front of me and said, eat up. He laughed his cackling laugh and walked back into the room with the television. At this point, I was frozen in fear. The hunger was so overwhelming, but the sight of the decapitated rabbit almost made me lose my appetite. Almost. What I did next was unspeakable, and the sheer thought of it makes me cringe. When I was finished, I laid on the floor in a ball and cried myself to sleep. I still heard the man chuckling throughout the night and eating what smelled to be rotten meat. I awoke to the sound of dripping water. It was coming from somewhere in the kitchen, the open door just a few feet away. The smell hit me, just as pungent as it was when I went to sleep. My eyes started to water at the pure concentration of the odor, and the nausea set in. How long has it been since I arrived here? A week? A month? It sure felt like forever, but time was useless for me, since I knew however long it had been wouldn't affect how long it would be until I could leave. Eight Feet Tall Posted by Unknown My father's family home was just a little under two hours away by car from where we lived, a small village surrounded by farmland. I often stayed with my grandparents during my summer vacation and winter breaks from school, and they were always happy to play with me, but the last time I visited them was over 10 years ago now, when I was still in my third year of high school. It was my spring break and I had been invited to visit, and since the weather was good, I rode my bike out to their house. After I got there, I was a little cold, so I stretched out for a moment in a warm, sunny spot off the road. Then I heard something strange. It wasn't a mechanical noise. It sounded strange, but human. I looked about to see where the noise was coming from and saw a white hat peeking over the top of the hedge. The hat moved along to a break in the hedge when I could see that it was being worn by a woman with a white dress. She had to be tall, though. The hedge was over two meters high, six feet. Before I could really think about this much, the woman was gone, seemingly disappeared. The strange sound was gone too. At the time, I just guessed that the person's apparent height had been due either to wearing very tall platform shoes or that it had been a man dressed up like a woman. Odd, but that was all. A little later, while having tea with grandma and grandpa, 
I mentioned the strange person I had seen and that I thought it was a transvestite, but when, as an afterthought, I also mentioned the strange puh, puh, puh noise, my grandparents panicked. My grandpa suddenly showered me with questions. When did you see this? How much taller than the fence? Did they look at you? I answered as quickly as he asked. Then he rushed to the phone in the hallway, shutting the sliding door so I couldn't hear the call. The room was suddenly very quiet. Grandma smiled a little, but was trembling for some reason. Grandpa came back soon and told me I would be staying overnight with them. I had to admit that I didn't understand what the fuss was about and asked what was so bad about the strange woman. Grandpa said, Grandma can tell you. He then looked at her and said he was going to pick up someone named K. San, Mr. or Mrs. K, and then left. In a clearly shaky voice, Grandma said, It seems that Hachisha Kuzuma has become interested in you, but we shouldn't worry. Grandpa is making arrangements. Grandma then told me, a little at a time, that Hachisha Kuzuma was not a person. She was some sort of monster named Hachisha Kuzuma because of her height. Eight shaku, Japanese foot, about 11.9 inches tall. Hachi, eight shaku, foot, sama, person. Her appearance could change somewhat, sometimes young, sometimes old, but she would always be abnormally tall and would always have a creepy laugh. Once Hachisha Kuzuma took an interest in a person, they were hunted to death in just a few days, and the last known victim of Hachisha Kuzuma had been 15 years previous. I learned later that Hachisha Kuzuma was supposed to be trapped in a shrine near the village, having been sealed in by four statues of Jaizo, a protective deity of children, each placed to the north, south, east, and west of the structure. The village had some sort of agreement with its neighboring villages, wherein they were given some advantages to make up for the fact they had to watch over the monster. For example, they got first priority on water use. Since it had been over a dozen years since Hachisha Kuzuma had killed anyone, I have to wonder if the old men in those villages thought it was still a good arrangement. At the time, I couldn't quite believe what I was being told, of course. But then Grandpa returned with a very old lady. Kaysan, for that's who it was, handed me a small paper charm and told me to hold on to it. Then she and Grandpa went upstairs. While they were upstairs, I tried to excuse myself to use the bathroom, but my grandma wouldn't let me go alone, and she insisted on keeping the door open and an eye on me as I was using the facilities. This is when I started to really understand just how serious my grandparents felt the situation was. I was soon led upstairs to a bedroom. The single window in the room had been covered with newspaper, on which a charm like the one I was holding had been affixed. In each corner was a small pile of Mauritio, sacred salt, and they had also set up a small wooden box with a statue of Buddha on it. I was told I would have to stay in the room until 7 the next morning and that I couldn't leave no matter what. They provided a bucket for me to potty in. Grandpa made it clear that neither he nor Grandma would talk to me until 7 the next morning. Kaysan told me to keep the charm on me and to pray to the Buddha if I got scared. I had a bed and a TV in the room. Grandma had left me snacks. I tried to watch some TV, but couldn't pay attention. I wasn't hungry either. So, I just lay on the bed, wrapped in the sheets, and eventually fell asleep because the next thing I remember was waking up to a late night show on the TV. My watch said it was around 1 a.m., and I heard something tapping on the glass of the window. I tried to ignore it. It was very persistent. I had some tea and a snack and turned up the TV to drown out the tapping. Then I heard Grandpa call from the hall. Are you all right? It's okay to come out if you're too scared. I started for the door automatically, but stopped myself as I remembered how insistent Grandpa had been that he wouldn't talk to me until seven. Again, I heard him, it's okay, come here. I wanted it to be my grandpa's voice, but somehow it wasn't. I suddenly had goosebumps all over me. Then I noticed the salt in the corner. 
It was becoming darker. I dropped in front of the Buddha, clasping the charm in both hands, and started praying for help. The tapping on the window started again, louder than before, more insistent. Then a definite hand slapped the window, despite the fact I was on the second floor. I did the only thing I could. I kept praying to Buddha. It was a long night. I really don't remember much other than praying until I heard the news on the TV. I looked over, and the morning clock on the news screen showed it was 7.13 a.m. Garth note. All Japanese TV channels show the time on screen during morning programs. The tapping had stopped. The voice was gone. The salt in the corners was almost black. I gingerly opened the door. Grandma and Kaysan, both looking worried, were there. Grandma, in tears, told me things were going to be okay. Downstairs, I found my father waiting. Grandpa came in from outside, and we needed to drive off outside. I found there was a number of men standing around near a van. My grandpa's car was in front of the van, and my father's was behind it. I was seated in the middle of the van with eight of the men sitting around me, one to each side, and then three in front and three in back. One more man took the driver's seat, and Kaysan took the passenger side of the front. I was told to keep my eyes closed and my face pointing down. You are the only one who can see Hachisha Kuzuma. Don't look at her. Our convoy started off, slowly at first. I don't think we had even traveled 20 kilometers before Kaysan warned us things were about to get hard. Then she started to chant phrases that sounded Buddhist. And then I heard the laugh again. I clutched the charm to my chest and kept my head down but couldn't resist a quick peek at the window. That was a mistake. I could see a white dress. It appeared stationary to the car's window, even though we had to be moving very fast at that point. The figure moved as if to lower its head to the window, and I gasped, and the man next to me told me to shut my eyes, which I did, and tightly. Though no one else could see Hachishikuzuma, they all heard what happened next, the tapping. I don't know how, but the tapping started on every window in the van, all at the same time. I don't know how long it lasted, but over time, it faded. Kaysan had stopped chanting by that time as well, and eventually said that she felt we were now safe, so the cars all pulled over. My father and grandpa thanked all the men who had assisted. As it turned out, all of them were related to me. Grandpa and Kaysan had hoped to confuse Hachishikuzuma by surrounding me with many people of the same bloodline. I had to stay overnight while Grandpa was gathering my kinsmen, and it was deemed safer to try to escape during the day than the night. Kaysan asked me to show her the charm which I had forgotten I was still holding. It had turned almost entirely black. Kaysan commented, it should be all right now, but just in case. And with that, she handed me a new charm to hold until I got home. I drove home with my father. During the drive, he told me that one of his friends when he was young had been taken by Hachishikuzuma. Grandpa and the neighbors delivered my bike back to me later. In talking to my grandpa over the phone, I've confirmed that it was not his voice I heard outside the room that night, which sent shivers down my spine again. Hachisha Kuzuma targets teens and children, so if the monster speaks with a familiar relative's voice, the victim would normally come to it willingly. I'd almost forgotten this all after 10 years. Grandma called to tell me that one of the Jaizo statues that had sealed Hachisha Kuzuma into the shrine looked as if it had been broken by someone. The statue that was broken lined up with the road, leading to our home. Two years ago, my grandpa died. Sadly, I was not allowed to attend his funeral. I try to tell. Myself, it was all superstition, but sometimes I still hear that voice call, Popopo. Writer's Block Hosted by Shakespeare's Cardigan When you hear of crime writers, you think of people like Michael Connolly or Rick Castle. Those guys are schmucks compared to me. 
The same plot lines rehashed over and over and repackaged into new covers with slightly more entertaining titles each time. You see, with me, everything I put in the pages of my books are legitimate. Now, I don't just look up old crimes on the internet and try to make them more appealing to the modern reader. No, that's too simple. I commit crimes. Just taking something from the past and plugging it into a little 200-page book isn't writing. Writing is about inspiration. The muse. My muse is the victim that's laying dead at my feet. My muse is the chase. My muse is planning. And then, after I find a place for the body, I go back home to my little single-bedroom apartment, turn on my laptop, and simply record everything I just did with a few more events and details to get a reader tuned in and attached. My publisher called me last night, begging me to pump out another book for next month. I could write one in a week, and since my last one has been out for a good four months, I felt I owe it to my readers to write another one. So, I begin my preparations. I flip around on some dating websites for a while, searching for my next character. My last three books were all about female cases, so I decided to search around for a man. After a short while, I settled on a cute redhead named Chris. After hopping onto the website's chat system, we arranged a date at this little cafe just down the street from my apartment for next week. I sit back in my chair and swallow the last of the scotch that was laying in my glass. The date is at seven, so I give myself a bit of time to get ready. I make sure to shave and throw on a cardigan. After I tie up my tie, I open up the word processor on my laptop, as I'm sure I'll want to get right to writing. The book's pretty much written up in my mind, and all I need is the main character's death scene. My last book was about a home invasion, a crime I did so enjoy committing, so this one will be about the dangers of online dating, something I'm sure will win me some points in the media as some may take it as a warning against internet pedophiles or some shit. I checked my phone, which was already lit up with a message from Chris containing some stupid enthusiasm for tonight. I quickly reply with the same thoughts and get back to my routine. After chugging a glass of scotch, I took the battery out of my phone, knowing the police could place it at the scene with pings from cell towers. I drop to the ground and retrieve a small metal box from under my bed. I shove a key into it and pop it open. The box contains my own little arsenal, a bowie knife, a bottle of poison purchased from an online retailer, a Beretta handgun, a long cord of rope, several bottles of blank pills, and a garrote. My plot is about a depressed man found dead in his house. Initially, the death is ruled to be a suicide until the young, attractive detective finds the real cause of death. To fit this into my plot, I'm going to have to get the young man back to his place and make it seem like he killed himself. I select the bottle of pills and place the box back under the bed, locked up. The clock reads 6.43, so I button up my jacket and throw on the hood. I close the door to my apartment and mount the elevator down the hallway. As I sit in the booth, I mentally check that everything is in place. Pills, check. Phone battery out, check. Alibi ready to go, check. Chris. Just as I reached the end of my list, a man matching the profile picture of Chris walked in. I waved to him and he smiled, sitting down. We talked for what felt like hours and we ordered food. He seems to be enjoying himself, but I'm not. He just talks about his polo club or his pet turtle Steven. We finally finish our food and the topic of after dinner activities starts. You know, my place is getting remodeled, I said to him. So if we wanted to watch a movie or something, we would probably have to go back to your place dash. Man, my place is a mess. I'm sure yours can't be that bad he says. We continue deliberations for a while, but he finally succumbs. In my mind, I can't help but wonder why he was trying so hard to get us to go to my place. No matter. My plan will continue. 
We arrive at a rundown apartment complex downtown in a neighborhood filled with nothing but derelicts and drug addicts. Chris leads me up to his apartment on the third floor, a shabby three-room maze of walls. Just gotta freshen up, I'll be right back, he says to me with a smile. Feel free to get some drinks. I in turn smile at him and move to the kitchen. I wonder sometimes if people can ever sense the twisted, emotionless psychology inside of me through my smile. I guess not, as I haven't had a character run for me yet. I pour two glasses of vodka I found in his fridge and sit on his couch, a glass in hand. Resting one on my knee with precision, I retrieve two pills from the bottle and crush them up, dropping their powder into what would be Chris' drink. When he comes back, I slip the bottle back into my pocket. Thanks, babe, he says to me when I hand him his glass. I wait with anticipation as he raises the glass. My heart drops a little when he leans forward and sets it on the coffee table in front of us. You know, Mark, the name I used on the website. I wanted to show you something, he said, standing up. He walked across to a little wooden chest across the room. I bit my lip. I never liked being in a character's home for more than 10 minutes, and this was bordering 20. I bent down to my sock and was about to retrieve a knife from it. I would have to kill him like this, make it seem like he simply cut too deep in his wrists. I looked up to make sure Chris still had his back to me, but I saw him turning around. I stood up, leaving the knife where it was. Chris, what was it that you dash? I started, but I saw my answer in his hand. He was looking right at me, and in his hand he held a small pistol with a silencer screwed onto it. His warm smile changed into a thin, black line of ice, slightly curled upwards. Even his voice changed. You see, Mark, I'm a writer. A crime writer, to be exact. Well, not yet, at least. I'm trying to write a book. And you see, I'm just a wee bit stuck on how to kill the main character. I just need a bit of inspiration. My mouth gaped open at the scene of irony occurring just before me. I opened my mouth, but he shot me several times before I could even make a word. I fell to the ground, dead. And I bet that bastard just made a million off some shitty story of the death of Blake Myers, internationally renowned crime writer. You Forgot Me Posted by Mim Jenny and I were an item for a little less than two months. I knew that we probably wouldn't last. I mean, come on, she was Jenny Matthews, who every guy wanted and every girl wanted to be. The new girl is already the queen of the school, with her looks and her uncanny way of knowing everyone's secrets before they knew them themselves. And I was Nathaniel Twining, straight-A student, nearly 15 and the guy that everybody wanted to partner in classes just because I got the grades. I couldn't believe it when she came breezing up to me that grim Tuesday. Her smoky blue eyes locked on mine and she smiled, devastatingly sweetly. Nathaniel, she called across the playing field, and even before she started for me I knew I was a goner. She reached me, breathless from her dash across the field, and touched my shoulder lightly. Nathaniel, she said, I was wondering if... I was wondering if this was all a hoax. Coffee with Jenny Matthews after school? A nobody's dream. Um, if I've got nothing on after school, then, um, yeah, sure. It was a big mistake trying to impress her with my full social calendar. Oh, I know you've got nothing on. I've seen your locker contents. Everyone has, remember? I remembered. Calvin Banks, the school thug, had emptied my locker out last week and displayed its contents in all of the school trophy cabinets for all to see. His gang had a field day. Calvin was always making a play for Jenny. Everyone was. I was still sore about it. Yeah, I smiled weakly. Coffee sounds great. A month later, 
Jenny and I were sitting on a bench at the park. We had reached the stage where she was officially my girlfriend and my life was all the better for it. I was cool. It was the coveted prize. Calvin had stopped being a jerk to me and I even had a less dorky new name, Nathan. At the time me and Jenny were laughing over some prank I'd played on Mr. Windrening, a thing that Nathaniel would never have dared to do, but one that Nathan was familiar with, and I was thinking things were the best they could be. Until Jenny told me the news. I have something I've been meaning to tell you for about a week, she said. Nathan, I'm moving. It was a blow I had never expected would come. Losing my rep and my girl? I was totally unprepared for it. Jenny's smile was sweet and sad. I know, awful, right? I'll have to charm the next lot of students into making me their queen, but I'll never find another guy like you, Nathan. I think my heart crumbled as she said this and squeezed my hand. Don't forget me, okay? She said then. Promise me you won't forget me, Nathan. My heart stuck in my throat. I promised. She was gazing off into the distance, as if pondering my nickname. Nathaniel. And then Jenny was streaking across the park, through the twisted shadows of the trees, caught up for one last time in the glorious glow of sunset. I never saw her again. For years later, and I'd forgotten all about Jenny, I was now in a new relationship, engaged to the woman who carried my unborn child. I was thrilled. Carol was everything I'd ever wanted, beautiful, smart, funny, and artistic. She was more than just my fiancé. She was my best friend. We'd been together for two years, known each other three, and my brief relationship with Jenny seemed nothing compared to Carol's companionship. And the child, well, that was a huge joy I could not fully comprehend. I knew the baby was a girl. We were going to call her Lily, Lillian Magda Twining. It was not until one evening, when me and Carol were going to bed, that I got a dark sense of foreboding. I knew then that somewhere, somehow, there was an evil too great to imagine. I thought it was amply a hallucination. And soon after, I was sleeping soundly, whilst Carol dreamed by my side. When I woke up, I did not open my eyes. I stretched out one arm, seeking Carol's warmth. But all I found was the wet, sticky sheet. Opening my eyes, I stared in horror at my fingers, soaked in the pool of blood, soiling the bed sheet. Lifting my eyes from my hand, I was horrified to see what had become of my fiancé. The bedroom looked like the Mary Jane Kelly crime scene we saw when studying Jack the Ripper in school. Flesh and limbs and organs were everywhere. It looked like someone had left my beloved Carol in there with a pack of cannibals. She was well and truly torn apart. There was no hope that her heart was still beating. The room was spattered with the remains of my fiancé and my unborn child. But the most terrifying thing at that time was the writing on the wall. I just glimpsed it before passing out. Big, bold letters daubed in Carol's blood. You forgot me. Why I didn't shower for 21 years. Posted by your face. I have nightmares where I'm trapped in a shower. The drain is plugged and the water won't stop pouring down on me. Water rises to my ankles, to my waist, and then over my head. The shower curtain turns to glass and my screams turn to gargles. A dark figure presses its face against the glass on the other side and it watches me. I plead, but it won't let me out. I swallow water and flail helplessly in my glass coffin. I wake up gagging. I know where the nightmare came from. I never have to dig deep. The incident is never far from my subconscious. Finding it is easy. Getting over it is not. It was the summer of my 12th birthday when the Hudsons moved in across the street. Three people, 
one of them a really old woman. She was tiny, frail, skeletal almost, thin white hair, faded, blue flowery dress. Her head hung from her neck, and it wobbled as the man pushed her up a makeshift wheelchair ramp into the house. At the time, I couldn't figure out if she was alive or dead. A few minutes later, she appeared in an upstairs window, sitting in her wheelchair. She was directly facing my bedroom, and I cautiously peered out from behind my curtains. Her head was upright now, and she stared at me, just stared, without moving her head an inch. I closed my drapes. For days, she sat at the window. She watched the cars putter down our suburban road and gazed at the neighborhood kids scurrying through their yards. I never saw anyone else in the room, never saw her move from that wheelchair. At night, I'd nervously peek through the crack in my drapes. Her silhouette was still in that window, lights off, staring out into the darkness at my bedroom. I couldn't tell, but I knew she was watching me. The stories about her cropped up pretty quick amongst my friends in the neighborhood. That she was a witch. That she was just a doll. That she was actually dead. But I knew she wasn't dead. Sure, I never saw her move from that window, not once. And I never saw her head turn. But I felt her eyes move as they studied me. I could feel her watching me, all alone in my bedroom, in the middle of the night with my drapes firmly shut. I'd wake up and shudder. Her eyes were on me. I just knew it. I began sleeping on the floor. The lower I was, the better. Maybe she couldn't see me if I was on the floor. I told my parents that the old woman across the street was creeping me out. I pleaded with them to talk to the Hudsons and ask them to move her to a room without a window. They laughed and told me to let her live out her twilight years in peace. She was just watching the street, they said, and that probably made her feel happy and feel younger. Are you just going to stick me in a windowless room when I'm an old lady? My mom laughed. Remind me to move in with your sister when I'm in a wheelchair. A week later, there was some commotion at the Hudson's. I watched from my bedroom window as the man ran out of the house and opened up the double doors of his van. He jogged inside, and he reappeared minutes later pushing the old woman in her wheelchair down the ramp. She looked frilier than before. She couldn't have weighed more than 70 pounds. Her head was flung to the side, resting on her right shoulder. Her body jostled in the wheelchair. But her eyes never left me, watched me the whole time. The man picked her up and placed her in the car. He folded the wheelchair and stuffed it in the trunk. He quickly hopped into the driver's seat. The younger woman pounded into the passenger seat and the man put his foot to the pedal. The old woman's limp head still faced me. It bobbed up and down as the van reversed down the driveway. I studied her face. It was expressionless, emotionless. Her tongue slightly hung from the right side of her mouth, but her eyes were on mine and they stayed on me. The van accelerated down the street and it was gone. My parents heard the news that afternoon from other neighbors. The old woman's condition was getting worse and the Hudson's had taken her to some sort of a home. She wouldn't be coming back. I went straight to my bedroom and I looked across the street. I smiled. Her window was finally empty. The Hudson's didn't come back the next day. No one. That night, I looked out towards the old woman's window. There was no one there, no wheelchair. But the bedroom light was on. I remember telling my dad I thought it was strange, and he just shrugged and said, must be on some sort of timer or something. I woke up in the middle of the night and nervously peered out my bedroom window. That bedroom light was still on. It suddenly flicked off, and I ducked below my window frame. I slowly rose and looked out, expecting to see the silhouette of that tiny, skeletal being. I watched for 10 minutes, pinching and straining my eyes. The lights quickly flickered on and then off again. I slept on the floor again, 
clutching my pillow close. I had a late baseball practice the next evening. When I got home, my house was empty. My parents were at my little sister's softball game. I headed to the shower to rinse off. About three minutes into my shower, I felt cold. The hot steam was escaping the bathroom somehow, which didn't make sense because I had shut the door. I wiped the shampoo from my eyes, turned my head, and I heard a strange noise that would haunt me in nightmares for years, the metal rings of the shower curtain being dragged across the shower rod. Someone was slowly opening the curtain. The shampoo stung my eyes, and through the stinging I saw a dark figure behind the curtain. Long, pale, bony fingers gripped the curtain as it slowly opened. I instinctively backed up in the shower, and the curtain opened completely. There stood the old woman. I must have only looked at her for one, maybe two seconds, but at that moment time stood still. All these years later, I can still draw you a vivid picture of the horrifying image in front of me. Disheveled white hair, crazy in her eyes, bones jutting out from under her stretched skin, stark naked, blotchy skin, warts all over her body, skinny breasts hanging to her waist, hair where I didn't know people could grow hair. She smiled grotesquely, and I felt the shower tile against my back and the hot water pound my face. On the other hand, the old woman held a letter opener. August, she mumbled. August, August, August. I leaped past her, knocking her tiny body to the floor. I ran downstairs, naked and sopping wet. In my panic, I somehow remembered I was nude, and I yanked a pair of shorts out of the hamper in the laundry room, sending the hamper crashing to the floor. I hightailed it on foot down the street, eventually winding up at my friend's house. When the police arrived, they found the old woman, crumpled to a heap in the bathroom. The shower was still running. The policemen were all really nice to me, admiring me for my bravery. I told them what she said to me, August, and asked if they knew what she could have meant. It will be August in a few days, one of them shrugged. And you can never fully understand old and crazy, son. The Hudsons only came to our street once more to retrieve their stuff. The for sale sign was up in days. My mom told me they couldn't face the neighbors for what happened. Apparently, they had taken the old woman, the man's mother, to a special home downstairs. Somehow, someway, the woman managed to escape the home and caught a bus back to our town. It never quite made sense to me. She was so old, so frail, so helpless. She could barely move those weeks she lived in that house. How had she managed to travel hundreds of miles on her own? Anyway, you can imagine what this did to me. I didn't shower for 21 years. I took baths, which I suppose aren't that different. It's still a tub, and it involves hot, soapy water. But a shower, with its closed curtain, water peppering the tub floor, and steam climbing the walls, you get lost inside your own head in the shower. Thoughts consume you, and it feels so utterly safe. For a few minutes, you are alone from the world. It's your own private, misty kingdom. But that's what makes the shower dangerous. You're enclosed, vulnerable, naked. You're exposed. I talked to people about it, my parents, a shrink, but mainly I tried to push the incident deep down into places where I couldn't find it. I didn't talk about it with anyone since I was a kid. Life carried on. Besides the baths, I was pretty normal. A few months ago, something inside me clicked. I felt the urge to re-examine the incident. It was almost like a voice in my head was telling me to do it. My head wanted closure. I spent hours online one night, trying to track down any information on the Hudsons and the old woman. I finally found what I was looking for, an obituary for the old woman. She died four years ago. 
Somehow that walking skeleton hadn't checked out for another 15 years. The obituary photo was a black and white picture from when she was a young woman. It was a photo of her and her deceased husband on their wedding day. His name was August. And he looked exactly like me. I closed the browser and stared at my computer desktop for 10 minutes. It finally made more sense why she called me August. Why was she obsessed with watching me? Maybe she used to write letters to her husband, and that's why she was clutching the letter opener that night. For a small moment, I felt a little better. Things always feel better when they make more sense. Honey, is everything okay? It was my wife. I think so, I said. I took the first shower I had taken in years that night. I didn't even jump when the curtain rungs dragged across the shower rod and my wife entered. But as she embraced me under the hot water, one question wouldn't leave my head. How come the young woman in that wedding photo looks exactly like my wife?